Yes, uh, I uh, guess I can skip that first uh, slide, which was initiated by um, discussions with Sönke. I think that idea had been presented now for a couple of times in some presentations. What I would like to add is that the um, science industry could maybe think a little bit more about um, adopting the open source philosophy uh, in the from from the software um, community because everything I'm hearing today is somebody is contributing money and is getting like the research back or is earning anything arising from that research um, so that in the end it doesn't sound to me as if um, that research would be developed in any kind of open source manner um, and um, I'm not a specialist on that but I know a couple of uh, our clients they really uh, believe and have proven that you can actually build um, revenue models uh, on the basis of open source development. So it doesn't always need to be, um, you know, protected research um, that's uh, revenue generating. So that maybe just um, as an idea. Uh, we already talked about this earlier. There are different types of blockchains, and whatever, um, whenever you take a look at a specific project. Um, you need to understand w what precisely are we talking about. That's a question of how far is this actually decentralized. We have two levels. We have the validation level, so the ones running the nodes, um, the validators, uh, and that can be either permission or permissionless. Um, permissionless, obviously, Bitcoin, Ethereum, that's where the blockchain movement is coming from. And then uh, you can take a look on the access side and ask whether the blockchain is publicly accessible or only privately closed groups um, accessible. Um, and uh, yeah, well, the typical blockchain is to the top left. Uh, and the most uh, private industry blockchain or DLT consortia you see play in the uh, lower right-hand side angle. And I personally believe that the one on the top on the right-hand side, the permissioned uh, public ones, uh, are very interesting because they allow us, from a legal perspective, to actually put some kind of enforceable government structure on top of the... Uh, blockchain and they don't need to be closed shop like uh, so I'm wearing the t-shirt of the IPDB um, as I supported that uh, project right from the beginning and that is for example um, a, a German charitable foundation uh, it's here in Berlin and what they are trying to do is to organize a public blockchain uh, where only the members of the blockchain can run the nodes so that there is through the membership there is a kind of legal governance also applying to everyone um, building up the network and there are certain rules um, who the members can be there always must be uh, more than 50 percent from the nonprofit uh, sector and uh, only a minority from the private sector uh, so in case you are interested in supporting this. We are always looking for further non-profit members because there are more for-profit people knocking at our doors. Um, yeah, so I, I actually like that area up there because it allows us to create a little bit more certainty uh, on the legal side. Decentralization. So there are tons of projects out there which are basically typical centralized ventures using at some point of its product some blockchain technology. That's not really a decentralized thing, although all of those projects always claim to be decentralized. Um, you can actually mingle both things. Um, you can, for example, set up uh, a, a truly yeah, decentralized, welcoming uh, public uh, network um, on a non-profit basis and combine that with uh, for-profit like software development um, entities where the founders and the people actually working to realize that project can also earn some money, right? Because that's always um, part of their 
uh, incentive um, that uh, they can feed their family from what they are doing. Um, that's what basically Ethereum invented when creating the Ethereum Foundation, doing the um, ICO out of that nonprofit entity, and then distributing the funds to developers uh, by hiring their firms um, to actually uh, support the further development of the code. So um, I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, even though everyone wants to earn money, you don't need to stick with a purely centralized venture and just using some blockchain technology in the back. There are, I think, better structures um, to build this up. What is a DAO? <laughs> everyone likes to create DAOs. Um, a DAO um, is meant to be something that is not creating any legal entity between its participants. But uh, it's meant to be uh, a code which is just loosely connecting people uh, for one common uh, purpose. Um, unfortunately, if you join a group to pursue a common goal together, then you are creating a legal entity under the most jurisdictions. Um, I don't really came across uh, any um, that is not knowing this type of like un unregulated um, entity. Um, in, in Germany, it's called BGB Gesellschaft, Gesellschaft Bürgerlichen Rechts. Um, it's a simple civil law partnership. In other jurisdictions, um, those things are called unincorporated uh, unincorporated entities, um, but the problem with these types of things is typically that this default entity where you end up with when you don't really choose a specific type of legal entity um, is that everyone involved has unlimited liability. So that's maybe something to think about prior to starting a DAO and uh, how to prevent that. There had been some ideas to make an analogy to uh, franchise systems, for example, because it is acknowledged that the partners in franchise systems do not create such a default entity. But that is simply due to the fact we call them star contracts, because there's someone in the middle organizing the franchise system, and everyone participating have, has a bilateral contractual relationship to the center. Um, uh, but if you don't have that connecting dot in, in the middle, um, then it will be really tough to argue that you did not form such a default entity. So there's a lot of uh, thinking surrounding this, um, how to actually, uh, in a legal fashion, um, create a DAO which is not really owned by anyone specific and typically what's currently used are the foundations. Um, in Germany we currently promote the foundation like uh, limited liability companies because they are easier to handle um, but I think there will be a lot of development in that area. If you want to collect funds and uh, I think that was always the question how do we get science funded um, most important thing, never rush, take your time. You cannot fund within two or even four or even six weeks properly. Um, you, you need to think through the regulatory and the tax situation. Tax is really, sorry for that, tax is really important. Um, this nice example from Philip um, earlier with the three guys in Frankfurt asking for funds um, for their research, uh, calling it a donation token. Problem is, if you're not a charitable organization, then the donation is actually a present, and if a present is not handed over within you know, close family relationships, then you get easily very high taxes on that. Um, so that's typically something that you won't avoid. Um, so what they could do, they could do form an association, um, like another fine for research uh, purposes, uh, and then collect the donations into that charitable organization, uh, hiring them as scientists uh, for actually undertaking that research. Uh, that would be, I guess, from the tax situation, a, a better solution. Um, 
then um, the, the types of tokens, and, and uh, I'm very fond of the two research institutions who spoke earlier, the Frankfurt Business School um, and the Vienna University with its uh, Crypto Economic Institute. Um, all of them having their own uh, token uh, classes, and that sometimes um, makes it a little bit difficult. We need over time to agree on certain token classes in order to being able to easily communicate with uh, each other. And I completely agree, it's, it's a very difficult task because you can look at token classifications from so many angles. Um, but in order to understand the legal and the tax uh, situations, um, I'm, I'm jumping here. Um, this is, I think, the, the most important thing to understand. We basically have three, or if you include the donation token, four uh, types of tokens, and they all boil down um, to the MIFID definition of security in Europe. Uh, and the MIFID security for, uh, the MIFID definition for securities uh, requires transferability, tick the box for most of the tokens, negotiability, you can also take the box on the capital market. There, the first question mark can arise, but currently the regulators say any kind of cryptocurrency exchange is a capital market, so better tick the box. Um, standardized, there are very few tokens, maybe crypto kitties or something like that, but otherwise, uh, again, tick the box. And then the first one, um, where you get a differentiator to other kinds of tokens is the uh, requirement that uh, security can never be an instrument of payment. Um, and that is where you get out of the security token definition for cryptocurrencies, for anything that is meant to be used as means of payment. So typically Bitcoin uh, and Ether uh, would fall out of that definition here in Europe. Um, that was it with the written requirements for securities. And we always said within the finance group of the Bundesblock, that's way too wide. We need another criteria um, limiting the security definition for token purposes. And that is the last one, comparable to typical equity or debt instruments. So what makes a token comparable? Uh, and we believe it's basically the fact that you have the right to receive a financial return from the issuer. And if that is the case, you should typically be either in the debt or equity instrument area. Um, and um, you can read it now within the publication of the BaFin, the German regulator from August this summer, where they also repeat this restriction. So that seems on the German end fairly accepted and we hope since that is a European definition here um, that also the European regulators as a whole will agree on this limitation for uh, securities in the token area. And that is then also the point where you distinguish from what we call utility token, and I must admit we shouldn't use that term anymore because utility token is so confusing. The developers um, speak of a utility token when they speak of a native uh, coin of a blockchain that's typically forming, in our view, a cryptocurrency and not a utility. Um, but we, what we mean with utility here is that it represents a right for a service or a good you will find typically voucher models or club models uh, in this category. And maybe the easiest differentiator between cryptocurrencies and utilities is when you ask the question, is this instrument meant to be used in multilateral um, relationships between an unlimited number of people, then you're playing in the cryptocurrency area. Or is this instrument only to be used in bilateral relationships whereby one of the parties of those bilateral relationships is always the issuer? Then you're down in the utility token um, category. Um, so that's the current view from the legal perspective here in, in Europe. Um, and that is deciding about um, many things, about prospectus requirements, about 
um, license requirements. Um, uh, it will also give you a hint what to do on the accounting side and on the tax side with those token classes. Just an example, utility t tokens always come along with VAT, right? And securities usually don't come along with VAT, cryptocurrencies neither. They have other problems, right? If you issue a cryptocurrency, you have an immense tax problem because you cannot book a liability or anything else on the other side of your balance sheet, right? You increase the active side of your balance sheet immensely through an ICO, but there is nothing to compensate for on the other hand, and that means profit tax immediately on the difference. Um, I lost it. I guess you need to unlock it. I think the next slide was about, I still have 10 minutes, uh, the next slide was about the US situation. Um, so you always have to keep in mind, yes, um, you always have to keep in mind um, that law is already decentralized and a lot of people um, don't like this fact, but uh, think about it this way. Um, it would be a terrible thing if we would only have one global law and no choice where to live and under which cir circumstances. So we might have a little bit too many of jurisdictions on our globe, but the fact as such that law is decentralized is, in my point of view, a good thing. However, you have to deal with it. Um, a technology working on a global basis nevertheless cannot immediately um, uh, result in offering on a global basis. You need to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction and understand what's permitted and what needs to be done to, to be compliant in any jurisdiction that you're getting active in. And uh, a very good example is the token classification um, which deviates a lot between the US and uh, Europe. So typically, uh, even those tokens which do not require any license or permission or prospectors here in Europe will certainly uh, fall under the securities regulation in the US. And the reason is that they ask whether there are any expectations of profits from the investments, from the view of the investor, that come from the efforts of a third party, including the issuer. So when you're buying a token and you're expecting to make a profit because somebody else is building something, then you're a security under the US law. And typically that captures the situation that you find in an ICO. Um, maybe to make it more, maybe to make it easier to realize, I always like um, to compare it with the opening of a golf club where you sell your club memberships in advance prior to the lawn being laid, then that is a security in the US. In Germany, it would remain the sale of a club membership. That's the main difference. Unfortunately, the Swiss regulator has adopted its view fairly far towards the Howey test. Um, so the the public uh, announcements made by the FMA really read also uh, into that direction. If you have a pre-functional token, um, you always need to be careful because you might be a security under Swiss law. Um, so Switzerland moved a bit into that direction. Yeah, um, not sure if we, sh yeah, maybe a little bit. E-money, um, I think Philip mentioned that earlier that the, he would like to see a euro token. Um, there is actually already a euro token in place that is issued by a French entity called Tempo France. Um, so Tempo France is issuing the euro token. It seems to have all licenses it needs for that. Um, and it's promising that uh, it will pay out the fiat euro if you're handing back the euro token to them. Um, so the, the, the market is already moving into that direction. We call this kind of token e-money and it requires a license which 
our German regulator will unfortunately not grant to any startups. It's seen as a small banking license because it allows you to make deposit making business, deposit taking business. You could take deposits from others and promise to pay back the fiat under certain circumstances and that's very highly protected and it's very difficult to obtain um, that license here uh, in Germany. Um, there are other things uh, to consider, for example, when you're issuing a profit participation, as had been mentioned for research projects earlier, um, you need uh, to watch out that, again, you're not in the deposit-taking business, be deemed to be a bank requiring a banking license, and how can you do that? Excluded from that are only bonds, which you cannot issue. Uh, because they are not uh, digitized yet. Um, and then the second instrument um, is uh, subordinated instruments. So what you need to do with a proper participation when you want to issue that in Germany, you need to put in a subordination clause. Um, yeah, alternative investment fund, that's another large area of, of regulation. And basically, whenever people pool their funds, to invest it uh, in, in a certain manner together year in the fund regulation, which means that the manager of the fund needs, again, a license. Um, that could also easily ha uh, happen with uh, research projects um, if they are not built up in a, or set up in a way that they can be seen as an operational entity. There are tons of other licenses, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see when you're working on a lot of cases and having a lot of um, inquiries with the regulators um, that also they um, come up with new ideas and thoughts, and currently what we're discussing is um, the, uh, the, the, the basically in-house trading. Any company dealing with crypto is to some extent trading is to some extent uh, trading also um, token. And the, um, under certain circumstances, this already might give reason to require a license. Um, that got into the focus just a month ago. And I'm very curious where we end up with that topic. So there are a lot of hurdles um, if uh, people want to. Um, but in Germany, I still recognize the regulator and also the politics to be fairly open. They don't want to get everything out of control, but they are also not acting in a way that they basically prevent uh, everything. But they expect you to talk to them and um, to comply with the, with the current laws. So, some recommendations out of praxis. Uh, in the white paper is a legally relevant document. Full stop. You will not get away with that. So, it must be truthful um, and, um, yeah, drafted carefully. Um, then alongside of that come the terms and conditions for the token sale. They might be combined with the terms and conditions how to use the tokens. That's especially the case for the utility tokens, so vouchers and the like. Um, and then number three is really important because the regulators read already tons of those. Don't copy and paste. Really. Um, doesn't make any sense. They won't believe your word. Um, really make make your make it your own draft. Um, communicate with the regulators. Do not try to hide anything. They are everywhere. They are in Telegram. Um, they have um, developers on their own which look into GitHub. So don't believe that they are not seeing what you're publicly doing out there. Um, yeah, whenever you want to. Go global, as any project I think I know wants to do. Um, don't work with blacklists only. Start with a whitelist, with a whitelist of countries where you feel comfortable. And then decide step by step how to grow. The blacklist approach really doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, in the regulatory field, um, a lot of uh, 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 a lot of things that you might be doing without knowing 
could even bring you into jail. So if you want to keep your freedom to travel, you better check in advance um, where you market your tokens or where you sell it. KYC, AML, well, that's basic by now. I don't have any project on my desk who's not doing KYC, AML anymore. It's simply a requirement from the bank. If you ever want to get fiat back into um, your bank account, you need to have that done and you can't repeat it. If you did your ICO without doing that, you have no chance whatsoever to get that information later on. So better collect it at that point in time um, so that you're able to present it when it's needed uh, and otherwise your bank might simply close down your account or freeze um, your funds. Um, Pre-sale, nearly any project is coming and saying, oh, I'm doing my pre-sale tomorrow to a couple of friends. Well, there is no exemption whatsoever for pre-sales. So the laws apply for the first <laughs> sale that you're doing. That's, uh, that's simply the case. E-commerce rules, I personally believe they, are, they might be even more dangerous um, than, than the financial regulatory stuff. There is a lot of things um, to observe and the e-commerce rules like the GDPR are not written for blockchain business models, but they are written for typical internet um, business models. Uh, so the rules don't really fit. We lawyers don't really know how to apply. There is a lot of uncertainty um, in that area. Yeah, and the last point I already made. So thank you very much.